quotes from, from we'll look at a few more from Augustine and then we'll get moving. You're on what does the Bible say? Okay, it was a good program. Hey, I appreciate uh, I'd that. I'd like to see you go to some of these uh, schools, college or whatever, and, and see if uh, one of the professors would debate you, the ones who's given these so-called doctor's plaques to put off. Well, we talk to their students. I mean, their students ought to be the representative of the school. The school basically just said, this man is up to snuff, and we gave him a degree, like John Lester. He's got a degree from Liberty. But John Lester isn't going to debate. You know, and then we debated uh, John Carpenter. He's got a Lutheran PhD. And then some time ago, a couple years ago, we went over to Wake. We were up in like the theological building. We were with all these people. They were Presbyterian. They had their degrees. They did not want to talk. So we're up for it. Like we, we wish it. We would love for it to happen. But I think that really they have too much to lose than to I'll open. Keep up the good work. I, I know y'all got a long road in front of you, but uh, it's a shame it ain't more people. Well, I appreciate your encouragement. All right, now, caller says we ought to be getting, uh, you know, more guys who are, quote, the scholars to have these conversations. Uh, I've debated with a Ph.D. My dad debated against somebody who has a Ph.D., uh, A.C. Smith. He's a Baptist with a Ph.D. We're fine to entertain the idea. I had one guy who was a Presbyterian, and he was going through seminary, and he said he would like to debate me. And I said, well, you know, we can take it. And he said, well, I'd like to finish going through my seminary. And I said, you know, hey, man, I'm not trying to be ugly i said but you're not going to be any more prepared when you get in with seminary <laughs> you're just not you're going to spend time reading augustine when you're in seminary but you're not studying the bible that is how it goes okay now you see all this he's saying that it is indicative the behavior of babies is indicative to their sinful nature like what throwing your limbs around crying and y'all act like that's all a baby does right we went to school with one guy, and he, we were all living in apartments. They lived underneath us, and, I, and you know, you could hear in these apartments. And we told him one day, we said, man, that baby does not cry. Like, we have not been hearing anything from that baby. I said, y'all got like a good baby, and then he kind of laughed, and he said, he said, I hadn't really paid attention to it. He said, but now I am thrilled with this baby. He said, because you're right. He doesn't cry. Good little baby. Well, what does that mean? Hey, he's crying some don't, but y'all say all of them equally born in sin. So what difference does it make? Okay, let's do this, y'all. We got half the show left, and this is what we're going to do. I'm going to now present. Look, here's what I did. We recap just really quick. We'll go through really quickly. Augustine says babies are born in sin. The religious community says of John Calvin. John Calvin hatched the egg that Augustine laid. Born in Catholics say babies are born in sin. Baptist, Doctor, Pastor, VP. Mr. Hodge over here, he says, Amen, Padre. They teach born in sin. They believe born in sin. And so I'm showing you that all these books that you're going to read, you're always going to have to be funneled through a man named Augustine. Before anything else, you're going to hear about Augustine. Page 8, Augustine, Five Points of Calvinism, Why I'm Not an Arminian. Section 2, Augustine. You see what I'm saying here? Albert Mole wants you to check out Augustine. You start looking at Augustine, these are the ridiculous comments that he makes, but he's the one who's basically giving you the idea. Now I want to show you Bible passages why I don't believe that it's in sin. Now, I will tell you, these are some, some standbys, if you will, right? Look at Matthew chapter 18. This is not where I'm going to start, but if you look at uh, Matthew 18, verse number 2, I, this is fantastic. Jesus called a little child unto him, set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except be converted and become as little children, you shall not, not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now all Baptist preachers look at this passage and they scratch their head and they say, Babies just as sinful as the adults. They're all born in sin, so why is Jesus telling a sinful adult to become like a sinful baby? Well, we're not going to do that one. And then one more is Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 4, Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. If y'all are out here teaching that the babies are just as wicked as the adults, why is Jesus saying to become like little children? Matthew 19, 14, here's where I really would like to start. Uh, Romans 5, 12. Now some of y'all are going to be saying, this dude is out of his mind. But I say, this is exactly where I would like to go, to have the conversation for born in sin. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore as... 
as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, you look at this passage, and I have to say this. We're playing chess now, right? Step one, step two, step three. How do you get there? What are some of the problems you're going to run into when you do this? So, this is a problem that people have when they look at the Bible. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. So, I was talking, I was door knocking, and I found some people who went to North Main, and they, uh, North Main Baptist in Danville. And here's my thing. If I came in contact with a stranger, and I knew that we disagreed, like, you know, I said I was a Christian, they said we're Baptist. The first thing that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to is I'm not going to say, can I talk to you all about born in sin? You know, and I'm saying, I know you all have heard me say that Mark talks to Baptists that way because Mark used to be a Baptist, and he's one of the things that drove me up the wall. He said, I could never understand why, uh, why God basically told us to be good when he made us with a sinful nature where we can't be good. I'm for that. But I'm saying from the Baptist perspective, and they know I'm not Baptist, they want to talk to me about born in sin. That makes no sense. But let me show you something. They knew Romans 5.12. Those North Main Baptist members, they said, well, we, Caleb, we believe born in sin. Like, that's what they wanted to hit me with. They said, we believe born in sin. I said, no, I, I don't agree with that. And then the man said, haven't you read Romans? I have, I have read Romans 5. I don't believe born in sin. And it's going to be right here, y'all. Here's one of the problems y'all are making. Y'all come to the Bible and you bring your English dictionary with you. That is not how this works. Y'all look at the word baptism in the Bible and you get an English dictionary and an English dictionary says to pour, sprinkle, or to immerse. The Bible doesn't give you all those options. So here's one. When you look up the definition of so in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, this is what you're going to get. In a manner or way indicated or suggested, that's one. B, in the same manner or way also, thus, for, the, for, uh, for so the Lord said, and then, then, subsequently, that is how y'all are using the word so in Romans 5.12. And so, are you with me? Let's read it this way. You find, here are your options, in like manner, also, or D, uh, then, subsequently. So here's how y'all are reading it. You go to Romans 5.12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So here, y'all take an English dictionary, and you read the word so as subsequently. One man sinned, death entered the world, and subsequently, death passed upon every man. That's not what that's saying. And here's my point. And now, some of y'all are going to say, well, Caleb, you can't just say that's not, not what that's saying. You know I know that. I'm playing chess with you here. We're going one for one, right? You get a move, I get a move. Y'all think it means subsequently, Adam sinned, and then subsequently everybody became guilty. Nope. When you use a Greek dictionary, and I would encourage y'all to make an investment for your home library, you get a set of books called Kittle's Theological Dictionary, and y'all are going to find the word huto. So, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and huto, so, Death passed upon all men that all have sinned. Now, I'm going to pull up our Bible program. We're going to Romans 5.12, and look at what we're going to find when we toe. In this way, okay, let's keep going down. In this manner, right here, likewise. Now, I know when you got your English dictionary, you said, Caleb, subsequently was an option. That is not how huto is being used in Romans 5.12. Huto is being used, as it says here, option B, in the same manner or way also. So here's what you really ought to be reading. Wherefore, as one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and also death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Why? Adam sinned, he died. We sinned, and we we die just like Adam. It is not a subsequent feature. It's a like manner feature. Now, I know that you can comprehend this. And let's say this. I'm not trying to be ugly. I know that you get it, 
Because when you read Romans 9 and you read Romans 10, he says, how would a Gentile be saved? He says, by faith. A Gentile would be saved by faith. And we're going to Romans 5. In this way, everybody be all think it means sin. I'm playing chess with death entered the world, and subsequently, death passed upon every man. So, therefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, for that all have sinned. So, same. You know, I know that playing chess. Good evening, everybody. This is What Does the Bible Say? My name is Caleb Robertson. This is a live television, televised religious broadcast brought to you by the Church of Christ. I say concerned Christians in the body of Christ. It's called What Does the Bible Say? These are our air times, and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll come in here and we'll still be working until the final seconds. And tonight, this is what I want to talk about. This man's name is Stephen Lawson. He is a Baptist preacher. And he has a clip, and we're going to use it tonight, where he's discussing being reformed. And you hear someone out there, and they, like they're talking and wherever, in the grocery store on the sidewalk, and you hear someone say, well, religiously speaking, I'm reformed. Say, what does that even mean? There's so much stuff, labels out there, and everybody wants you to wear like three, four different labels simultaneously, and someone says, well, if you're going to, you know, they've all got them, like the military puts there flags and medals and whatnot on their breast. All these religious folks, sectarians out here, putting their labels of their different opinions on their breast, and they want you to have like three. Well, when you put a fourth one on, they say, well, you can't wear that label and these other three labels. Look, I don't want to do that. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to be pigeonholed into some type of circle and sect and label of what you have an opinion over. My big agenda is from the Bible that Jesus died. <laughs> I come in and I say it's ridiculous that I have to communicate these ideas with religious folk. My agen agenda is that Jesus died for our sins, and when he died, he purchased the church. This is Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And... I, I look at that, and I look at John 17, 21, 20 and 21. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. So the goal is to take non-believers and make them believers in Jesus of Nazareth, that he is the Son of God, that as Acts chapter 8 says, he died and he rose. He's the Son of God. And we want to be one in that john 17 21 but over time people have risen up figures have risen up with their particular opinions these party leaders they're charismatic they get a bunch of people whipped up and they follow them and i'm trying to get y'all out of the frenzy of following men and get back into your bible reading your bible for yourself on a regular basis working on your character romans 8 29 you know this man mr lawson he says he's reformed you don't have to worry about your character if you're a Calvinist. You didn't do anything to become a saved person, and you can't do anything to become a non-saved person. So you don't have to worry about character. And they'll say, well, okay, that's a misrepresentation. No, it's not. Can a person who's elect have such a bad character that they lose their election? And you say, if they're truly elect, they're not going to do anything to lose their election. Thank you. Romans 8, 29. Then you don't have to worry about Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. I actually am promoting conformity to the image of Jesus the Christ. Y'all just say, no, you looked at that. I used Romans 8, 29, and you guys went over to Romans 9, 16 and said, well, it's not about what man does. Hey, I'm promoting morality. I'm promoting Bible study. I want you to get in your text. God gave you a good brain. You can figure this out. Now, what we're doing... I say to my YouTube audience, stay tuned after 9 p.m. We're going to have more discussion. My phone number is 276-806-3641. My email address is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. If you email me, we'll put you on the informer list. Page and a half Bible article that comes out every Sunday morning. We'll email it to you. Last Sunday, we discussed this. We said no creeds. Well, except for this one thing, and I'm still saying no creeds. You study the Bible. 
We're coming together, John chapter 7 again, verse number 20. On the basis of our faith in Jesus the Christ, we're coming together and we're trying to do the best Bible study that we can do and conform to His image. Excuse me, this is what it looks like if you watch on your smartphone, desktop, laptop, smart TV. Sunday night at 9 will be on WIG TV. Sunday night at 9 will be on Star News. Sunday nights at 6 p.m. you can find us on Houston Media Source. And if you're not in contact with any of those stations anywhere, at any time, you can, your cousin Ted in Wisconsin can get What Does the Bible Say? YouTube Johnny Robertson. Now, we want to end religious division. We're Christians only because we're following the Bible only. And I have to say this too. Uh, I think it's a pr pretty agreed idea. A lot of times atheists are very, very snooty. And so sometimes you'll find folk and they're like, look, it's just not for me. I think everyone agrees Richard Dawkins is snooty. And so some people will say, look, it's not for me. I just don't believe. If that's what you want to do, good for you. Okay, but my thing, also my other point is Calvinist people are usually pretty snooty. It's like, you know, I don't, I don't have to do anything to be saved according to the Calvinists, but they also think you're an idiot, like if you don't agree with Calvinism. So I say simple plea as we get going, Romans 12, 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. And down at the bottom I say it's about bringing people along to better thinking. And I think that the idea of better thinking is not subscribing to a creed like they do, 1689 London Baptist Confession, but rather having a common mind to say, look, we're going to go out here and find these skeptics, atheists, agnostics, and we're going to try to make them believers. And then we take these people who are just straight sectarians circled off by themselves, and we're going to try to convince them to drop their creeds and their traditions and just simply be Christians in the body of Christ. That's what we're doing tonight, and here is where we are. Now, I want to take a moment, before we even get into this, I want to show you, people who are watching on Star News, you didn't get to see this, but this was what our uh, bumper for YouTube. I did this broadcast in 2021. And I'm discussing Romans 5.12, which is particular to our discussion tonight. But I want you to hear this conversation because I want my brethren to hear it. You keep studying, and when I was listening to this, I basically thought I heard myself making this argument, and I now at this point in time realize I could have made this argument better, you know, two years ago. And it's always that way. But my thing is, if you don't start trying and you don't get involved, you're never going to look backwards and say, mm, I could have done that better. Listen to this, and I'm going to show you in just a moment. That's with you here. We're going one for one, right? You get a move, I get a move. You all think it means subsequently. Adam sinned, and then subsequently everybody became guilty. Nope. When you use a Greek dictionary, and I would encourage you all to make an investment for your home library, you get a set of books called Kittle's Theological Dictionary, and y'all are going to find the word huto. So, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and huto, so, death passed upon all men that all have sinned. Now, I'm going to pull up our Bible program. We're going to Romans 5.12, and look at what we're going to find when we pull up huto. In this way, okay, Let's keep going down. In this manner, right here, likewise. Now, I know when you got your English dictionary, you said, Caleb, subsequently was an option. That is not how huto is being used in Romans 5.12. Huto is being used, as it says here, option B, in the same manner or way also. So here's what you really ought to be reading. Wherefore, as one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and also death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Why? Adam sinned, he died. We sin, and we die just like Adam. It is not a subsequent feature. It's a like manner feature. Now, I know that you can comprehend this, and let's say this. I'm not trying to be ugly. I know that you get it, because when you read Romans 9 and you read Romans 10, he says, how would a Gentile be saved? He says, by faith. A Gentile would be saved by faith. And you come over to Romans eleven twenty six. 26. Well, how's an Israelite going to be saved? And so all Israel shall be saved. Huto. Now, that's not wrong. <laughs> the argument's still right. 
But as I was listening to this before we got going, there's a simpler way to do that. You don't connect Romans 5.12 to Romans, you can, Romans 11.26, but there's a simpler way of connecting it to Romans 6.11, where huto is just straight up translated likewise. There it is. So when huto is translated likewise in Romans 6.11, it could have been translated likewise in Romans 5.12. My point is, I look backwards and I see some of my past work and I, I watch and I say, ah, oh, I could have done better on that. And I don't look backwards and see that past broadcast and say, oh, I could have done better. And because I didn't, I'm just going to quit forever. You got to start trying. You got to get your practice and you can do it. And, you know, you say, well, I'm never going to talk to Stephen Lawson. Probably not. But there are Calvinists in your area and you could be having conversation with them. And someone says, well, to what end? I'm trying to get them to stop pressing the five points of Calvinism on everybody that they come in contact with. Now, let's do this. Let's go to our clips and you say, well, Caleb, what does reformed mean? We're going to let Mr. Lawson do it, but really quickly, I want to give this to everybody because you say, I don't know Stephen Lawson and Caleb says he's a Baptist. Well, I'm Baptist and I don't know him. Well, you know this Baptist. Result, cast out of the garden. Now, Adam is the fountain of all the human race. When he sinned, his sin was transferred, carried down to every single human being. When you and I come into the world, we come into the world with a bent towards sin. We have an old sinful nature. That's the way life is. You may not quite understand that. And I do understand the Now that's Charles Stanley, and he says everybody is born with a sinful nature that they inherited from Adam. Stephen Lawson would say that he agrees with that. And then because he agrees with born in sin, like Baptist teachers do, Southern Baptists, they believe in born in sin, Stephen Lawson would then tell all of y'all, you need to then adopt the remaining four steps of Calvinism. So I have this up here. He is a Baptist. And you say, well, Caleb, I don't know him. He's not a Southern Baptist. That's why you don't know him. But he is a Calvinist Baptist. And Calvinist Baptists will come up in y'all Southern Baptist Convention. And so you need to be made aware of all this. This is still building off of, we had the informer some time ago where I said, uh, anytime you disagree with a five point Calvinist, they're always gonna tell you, no, 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 you're misrepresenting me. And the comment on that particular informer, a man named Adam McCaskill, he comes on and he says, you're misunderstanding Calvinism. And so we've been doing a series on Calvinism and tonight, we're using Stephen Lawson. And, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm not Southern Baptist. I'm not Presbyterian-style Baptist, essentially is what these guys are. But Baptist News writes against Stephen Lawson, and it's for his Calvinism. This is him talking about the same thing uh, Adrian Rogers doesn't like. Adrian Rogers doesn't like the way that, uh, I want to call him a Presbyterian again, Calvinist Baptists use Romans 9, and that's what they're doing here. Well, are y'all all going to look at the Baptist News Global and say, you guys just don't understand Calvinism? And so you say, well, Caleb, what does Stephen Lawson say? Here's his clip. It'll just take two minutes. Listen to this. Here's Stephen Lawson. Well, I think when we say Reformed, we simply mean Biblical that we have come back to the Bible and allow the Bible to frame our doctrine. And, of course, Dr. Sproul has an entire book on what is Reformed theology, and he has five hallmarks of Reformed theology. Um, I would say certainly the foundation is the authority of Scripture alone, and the highest pinnacle is the glory of God above all things. And it was a recovery, or Reformed truth is the purity of the gospel, how sinful man can be right with holy God, and as well as, as what we heard today earlier from Dr. Ferguson, um, a restoration of the purity of worship in spirit and in truth. Um, certainly the five solas and the five points of the doctrines of grace uh, are certainly in that mix as well. Um, so when I think of reformed, in, in essence, God formed the truth, and then the truth became deformed by um, 
false teachers where tradition and ecclesiastical hierarchy became the authority and reformed is to simply bring it back to where God formed it. So man, by his uh, failure to properly teach the Bible, deformed it, and the reformers simply put it back to the form as God had originally given it. Now, you hear that, and you're not wrong if you basically say, look, Caleb's going to introduce this idea, the man Stephen Lawson. He says, I'm reformed. And you say, well, what does that mean? And I let Stephen Lawson talk to you for two minutes. When he gets done, you say, I still don't know what that means. Exactly. And here's my point. The reason you don't understand, it's not like there's nothing wrong with you. It's absolutely him and his system, his tradition. Look at Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through the through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions after the tradition of men, not after Christ. That was t it was only two minutes long, but you say totally convoluted, unnecessarily wordy, and also he started out by saying, well, what it means is we just let the Bible frame our ideas, and then he starts going into this thing about the five solas, and you say, well, what are the five solas? You're going to read your New Testament text and then come away with this idea that he says five solas. You could probably come up with more than, than that. What is that? It's onlys. Five onlys. You say, well, I could probably come out with like eight onlys. And then he says, and then you're going to have to have the five doctrines of grace. And he paused that way. And we're going to have a point on that a moment ago. And you say, well, I, did, I read through my New Testament. I don't really know what he's getting at about the five doctrines of grace. You go through this whole thing about, he said, some people polluted it and corrupted it, and then some other people come along and they reform it. You say, I still don't know what he's getting at. That's the tradition of men. And really, this is what I'm advocating tonight and regularly. Members of the body of Christ, this is what we're shooting for. This is Ephesians 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So if you ask me, well, Caleb, you're not reformed, what are you? I'm going to say, I'm a Christian. And then you're going to say, well, which faith are you? Like you say, I hear you're a Christian. Which faith are you? There's only one faith. You're, okay. It bothers y'all when I use biblical language. And you're going to say, well, okay, not forget the faith. You're going to say, which church are you in? And I'm going to say, there's only one body. I am a believer and a promoter of the most simple idea that you can have in the religious world. No sects, no divisions, no creeds, no hierarchies, excuse me, it's local collections of believers who are in the same church, who are following one faith. They are following the one faith. Look, you got a Bible, why aren't y'all reading it? And you say, well, you're not reading it. If you were reading it, you would be able to very quickly see through people like Stephen Lawson. So let's do it this way. He says, to be reformed, well, let him say it again. I want you to hear all this. Well, I think when we say reformed, we simply mean biblical, that we have come back to the Bible. Number one, that's a worthless opener. Everybody says that. You say, this, like a Mormon comes to your door and they say, well, we're Mormons. And you say, well, what does that mean? And they say, well, we think we're following the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and they say, well, what does it mean to be a Jehovah's Witness? And they say, well, we think we're following the Bible. Pentecostals, we think we're following the Bible. This opener, when you have this word reformed. Acts eleven twenty six does not say that the disciples were called reformed first at Antioch. They were called Christians first at Antioch. And so he makes this statement, well, if we say we're reformed, that means we're allowing the Bible to frame our doctrine as the framer of our doctrine. And here's my question tonight. If you all are out here claiming to follow the Bible, why is it that when I enter into conversations with you, that I have to be versed on, this is the Confessions of Augustine, a Roman papist. This is the 1689 Baptist Confession. 
32 articles of Christian faith and practice. Why? This one especially, you can see like the size of this one versus the size of this one. And these are just itemized things. Why can't I just, they got a section in here on baptism. Why can't I just read my New Testament and see what Jesus said about baptism and see what the apostles said about baptism instead of having to confer with some 1689 Europeans? I'm saying in today's world, all everybody talking about, well, you know, times change, culture changes, and I'm trying to take people back to what the Bible taught inside of its culture, regardless of culture, and Baptists are basically saying, what you need to do is you need to start looking at these people in Europe in the 15th, 16th century. Why would I do that? It makes no sense for you all to get up on stage and say, well, we're actually allowing the Bible to frame our thought process, and then you have people like Jeff Durbin Over the fact He's that we Baptist. have in our body, we're a reformed body of believers. We have the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. We are hardcore, pipe-hitting, five-point Calvinists. If there were more points to Calvinism to believe, we would adopt that, and we would make shirts, and we would do cups about it, because God is that kind of sovereign who desire, deserves all the glory. We're there. But we have such a diverse body of believers here, such a diverse body of believers, with the fact that we have in our body... We're a reformed body of believers. We have the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. We are hardcore, pipe-hitting, five-point Calvinists. When Jeff Durbin basically discusses himself and his particular sect, they itemize, them. They, they let themselves be known to people as what? We're reformed. That doesn't tell me. If I'm a Bible student, that doesn't tell me anything. He says, well, we're reformed. Well... What does that mean? That means we follow the 1689 London Confession, not the Bible. It's Europeans' discussion of the Bible. And you say, well, what did you get out of the 1689 Confession? He said, we got five points of Calvinism, and we're so devoted to John Calvin that if he had more than five points, then we would adopt extra points from John Calvin. Well, who's John Calvin? John Calvin's not even a Baptist. He's a Presbyterian who sprinkles babies. Now, you basically look at that, and any person who says, I'm trying to simplify my religion, right? I'm trying to get back to what the Bible says. I'm trying to get back to what the New Testament teaches a person to do to become a Christian and to go out and make disciples. How would I do that? Well, I'm not going to come away saying, hey, be reformed. I'm not going to come away and say, get the 1689 Confession or any creed. I'm not going to come away getting a Methodist discipline and whatnot or Southern Baptist Faith and Message, or the Apostolics United Pentecostal Church International Manual. You're never going to get that. I'm just saying read your Bible. You don't need the Book of Mormon. You don't need watchtower material. Just read your Bible. But this is how they portray themselves. And there's a collection of people out there that are falling for it. And I'm saying when we come to a table and we're going to have our discussion, I bring five guys in a room. I come in with my Bible, he comes in with the 1689 Confession, the United Pentecostal Church International, he comes in with his manual, the Methodists come in with their discipline. How are we going to possibly make any headway? And someone says, Caleb, you're not. That's what we've been telling you. People have told me and my dad, and they've been telling Christians for a long time that you're never going to achieve unity. Well, yeah, I mean, I have to agree. <laughs> I'm not going to really reach unity with anybody unless they're trying to even use the Scriptures to begin with. In Acts 17, 11, they searched the Scriptures. They did not say back to Paul, okay, let us go and talk to our rabbi and see what the Jewish tradition is going to say, the Talmud. They're not, look, if you're doing that, then I'm not going to be able to do too much with you. And I have been door knocking, I've told you this before, and it's not just Roman papists. I had one lady, she was a Roman papist, and she put her hand on my Bible, and she said, that does not matter to me. And this one, the next one was when I was living in Tennessee, and he was a Methodist man, and he was like, he was mad, he was getting loud, and he was trying to close up my book, and I said, well, why do you want to close up my book? He said, I want you to close that book so you listen to me. <laughs> I'd rather hear what the scriptures say. What does it mean to be reformed? Well, this is not it. Reformed people are not letting, Calvinists are not letting the Bible shape their thinking. What they're doing is they're going to their creeds. I just read my Bible, and I'm encouraging you just to read your Bible. And when you start reading your Bible, you are going to be 
totally surprised at how much you start finding out. There's a bunch of people out there, and they would be honest, and they would say, I don't know a lot of Bible. And they would say, but I have attended church services for a number of years. You weren't getting very much, if any, Bible going to those sectarian services. So if you would actually make a practice of just do it once through and see how you do. Jeff Durbin going to hate that I said that. But read the book of Matthew, then read the book of Acts. Read the book of Mark, beginning to end, 16 chapters, then read the book of Acts, 28 chapters. Then read the book of Luke, 24 chapters, read the book of Acts again. Read the book of John, 21 chapters, and then read Acts again. So you will have read the four accounts of the life of Jesus, and you will have read Acts four times. You do that and tell me how much you started seeing as you did your regular reading. And you could read that really in no time. It's not really that difficult to read 28 chapters inside the book of Matthew. But you do it, and I'm saying you're going to start seeing all this stuff where you say, oh, I didn't know how I didn't see this before, because you weren't looking before. You were letting the, quote, pastor spoon feed you. So here's my take on it. You don't need a creed book, and really you don't need the pastor telling you what to think. What you need to do is read your Bible. All Scripture, this is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You can read this, you can understand this, and this is going to help you start navigating through life. Really what's happening right now is nobody's reading their Bible, their lives are in shambles, and when they go, they, like, they get in a mess. They get in a life mess, and then they go to their pastor and they say, Oh, pastor, I'm in such a bad way, can you help me? And he's scared to death to tell you what the Bible actually says because if you get mad, you'll leave out of there, tell your grandmother, and your grandmother will start telling the deacon board, and then they're going to fire him. Y'all sectarianism and your board of trustees and your synods and your conventions have totally strangled the truth out of any conversation. So here's what I'm saying for you to do. Read John chapter 10 where it talks about the shepherd versus a hireling. Realize that you're one man pastor in a man-made sect, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Lutheran, JW, Mormon, they don't really care about you. You're just a paycheck to them, right? They come in, they're going to do their time, they're going to move out in a handful of years, they're trying to go to bigger churches like uh, Nick Hull. He left out of here, where did he go? He went to Northern Virginia, went to Alexandria. He's done with y'all. What did he do while he was here? Built up the building. Read your Bible, and you'd start growing exponentially. John 5, 39, what did Jesus say to the people that were around him? They're asking him all these questions. They're trying to figure out, is he who he says he is? They're trying to figure out, why do the religious elite hate Jesus of Nazareth? And he just tells them, search your scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Go read, he said, go read your scriptures. You're going to figure out these prophecies were pointing you towards me, and I'm out here fulfilling them. Read your Bible. That's what Jesus said. Just read your scriptures. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14. We command you, brethren, this is where people start getting in trouble. And it's really not any trouble. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after, not after the tradition which he received of us. And then someone says, oh, Caleb, you're so down on tradition, but there Paul just gave it a thumbs up. Well, look at what he goes on to say. If any man obey not our word by this epistle... Note that man and have no company with him that he might be ashamed. Look, this is not promoting where the church just gets to tell you and you say, oh, that's, that's the church tradition, therefore we follow it. In the same discussion, he said, the authority is coming out of the epistle. Now, let's look at it this way. We're going to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Tradition, he said, if they're not obeying the word of the epistle, 2 Thessalonians 3.6, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 15. Look at what he says. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. How do we teach people the gospel today? We use the finished revelation, the New Testament. To the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word, 
Or look at what it says, by our epistle. An apostolic figure, I'm saying one of the apostles, who comes to a particular city and he teaches, what does he say about it? Or our epistle. An apostle's oral teaching is on the same level as their epistle. But anybody who comes to town and they just say, look, this is the creed, and you have to subs subscribe to the creed, they don't have the authority to do that. They're not an apostle of Christ. We did that last Sunday. Geno Jennings is an apostle of Christ. Augustine, you've got to subscribe to the uh, confessions of Augustine. Augustine was a Roman papist. He's not even a Christian. Why would I look at this document and say that this holds any authority? Westminster Confession, which is for Presbyterians, why would I think that that holds any authority? And I'm saying Greek Orthodox do it, Roman Papists do it, Anglicans do it. They're all wrapped up in what a bunch of men said years ago, and none of them are apostles. An apostle wrote this, whether by word or our epistle. Now, one thing to note up here, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, when he says the tradition, do you know that that word is translated down here in 1 Corinthians 11, 2? Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them. So when he says traditions, it's translated in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, ordinances, which would be commandments. And what does he say to do with it? You keep them as I delivered them. Paul the Apostle. You should be following the written New Testament text, what the apostles gave to us. You should be studying it on your own. To what end? To go out and make disciples and to help your neighbors stop being sectarians and just be Christians only. Why? Members of the body of Christ, like me, I'm a Christian. You'll see my dad host this broadcast, Johnny Robertson. He's just a Christian. And people will say things like, uh, I'll talk with folk and they'll say, Caleb, I know you really hate Baptists. I don't hate Baptists. I'm, I'm wishing that they would stop labeling themselves something that the New Testament does not tell us to label. I wish they would give up their convention and their manual, their creed, Southern Baptist Faith and Message, and really get with teaching the New Testament rather than the traditions that they learned. And I'm saying tonight a lot of their traditions, again, are going to come from Roman, Romanists. Now, here's another one that he says. He says, to be reformed is to be to subscribe to the five alones, the five solas, grace alone, faith alone, Jesus alone, scripture alone, glory alone. And you hear that and you say, I don't even like know what he's getting at. Authority of scripture alone and the highest pinnacle is the glory of God above all things. And it was a recovery or reformed truth is the purity of the gospel, how sinful man can be right with holy God, and as well as, as what we heard today earlier from Dr. Ferguson, um, a restoration of the purity of worship in spirit and in truth. Um, certainly the five solas and the five points of the doctrines of grace. Uh, are certainly in that mix. All these ideas that you're not even going to get from reading the New Testament, he says the five solas, and you're, you know, you're just sitting at home, and you're out in that audience, you say, okay, well, I'm not like the brightest bulb. And so when he started all that stuff about five solas, I didn't even know what he was getting at. Grace alone, faith alone, Jesus alone, Scripture alone, glory alone. Some of these are pointless. He says faith alone, Scripture alone. Well, if you read your Bible you're going to recognize you can't have faith without having the Scripture. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But he's a Calvinist, so he doesn't even think that you really even need Scripture. They have it in there, Scripture alone. But if you start asking a Calvinist, do I need to read the Scripture in order to be saved? And they're going to tell you, no. Because it's not going to be the actual reading of Scripture that helps you come to faith. They're going to say either God chose to randomly save you or not. So I look at this, and I'm a Bible student, and I say, well, this is ridiculous. Scripture alone, faith alone. You can't have faith without reading the Scripture. Romans 10, 17. Now, someone is going to say, and we had this discussion in our Wednesday night exhortation. We come together, Christians, and we study together. This is what someone's going to say. They're going to go to Romans 1.18, and they're going to say, yeah, but you could look at creation. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. I understand there's a creator by looking at creation, but I do not understand Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. So in order for me to have faith in Jesus the Christ, I have to have scripture. So he gets up there, he gives this talk about what does it mean to be reformed, and he gets into the five solas, grace alone, faith alone, Jesus alone, scripture alone. Faith alone, scripture alone. I got to have scripture in order to have faith, so those two ideas are ridiculous for Calvinists. And then he says, grace alone, faith alone. If it was grace alone, you wouldn't even need faith. And then they're going to tell you, you don't need faith. Titus 2, 11 and 12. If you were reading your Bible, some people are going to watch this broadcast tonight, and I recognize, like as I'm talking to Southern Baptists, I'm talking to these Calvinistic Baptists, and some of you are going to feel left out and you say, I not any type of this Baptist, but you're in another sect. Look, if you're teaching born in sin, if you're teaching original sin, total hereditary depravity, this applies. You need to hear this information. The grace of God that, this is Titus 2, 11 and 12. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. But what comes next? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So if it's grace alone and you're just, that's it, you don't have to do anything, then you wouldn't have to produce faith. So they came up with these five onlys that don't even make sense together. Grace alone, faith alone. Well, if it was really grace alone, you wouldn't even need faith. And then a Calvinist will actually tell you based on Romans 9, well, you really don't have to have faith. God can randomly select you to be saved, just like he randomly selects people to be lost. And if you don't really have to have faith and you don't really have to know about Jesus and you don't play a role in that to them anyways, you're just a robot. Now someone they're going to say, Caleb, you're doing such a bad job mis misrepresenting these Calvinists. This is exactly what they would say, and I'm sorry that Calvinists don't really want to talk about it. Where's repentance, right? They put grace alone, faith alone, Jesus alone, scripture alone, glory alone. Where is the idea of repentance in this conversation? This is why I don't like making lists. This is why I said someone could get five onlys and someone could come in with like eight. Well, you got to have repentance only too. Acts 2.38, when they said, what must we do? Peter said, well, you're going to have to repent. He didn't go in and say, hey, five onlys. No, he said, you're going to have to repent. And you're going to have to be baptized. So there we go. Grace only, faith only, Jesus only, scripture only, glory only, repentance only, and baptism only. It's like, let's go through everything. Lord's Supper only. 1 Corinthians 11, because when we get there, we're going to find it. Lord's Supper only. First day of the week only. You could do this all day rather than just say, look, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm in the body of Christ. I subscribe to the New Testament. Just make it simple. I'm doing my best, and I'm keeping an open mind. If you feel like there's something that you can correct me on it, then let's talk about it. Most people aren't talking. Everybody's like sectioned up saying, don't talk to them, don't talk to them, and don't, don't let them talk to us. Acts 17.30, the times this ignorance God winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. This business of the five onlys is ridiculous. Here's the next one. He says, we believe in the five onlys, and then he goes, and we believe to be reformed is to su subscribe to the five points of, and then I have it there, long pause, because he wants to say Calvinism, but then he just says five points of grace. Listen to this. And I'm saying, y'all, sectarianism is sinful, and we'll make that point in a moment. Gospel. Man can be right with holy God, and as well as, as what we heard earlier from Dr. Ferguson, um, a restoration of the purity of worship in spirit and in truth. Um, certainly the five solas and the five points of the doctrines of grace, uh, points of the, um, certainly the five solas and the five points of the doctrines of grace, certainly the five solas and the five points of the doctrines of grace. Look. He can't just straight up say to you in the audience, we believe in the five souls and the five points of Calvinism, 
after he just said the Bible frames our thinking. Because you're obviously not going to read your Bible and ever find John Calvin in your Bible. That's exactly what they believe. I wish he would go ahead. I mean, if you're going to be a sectarian, like, he's pretending. I don't know why he doesn't just do uh, Jeff Durbin. Just go ahead and own it. Over the fact that we have in our body, we're a reformed body of believers. We have the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. We are hardcore, pipe-hitting, five-point Calvinists. The... Five-point Calvinists, yeah, that's Jeff Durbin. Lawson has to take that long pause and then say, uh, five, five points of grace. Can I have a moment again with Jeff Durbin? Lawson says to be reformed is to subscribe to the five points of Calvinism, five points of grace. Let me use Jeff Durbin now against the both of them. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's what he uses to bring dead people to life. And I know that Jesus says, all that the Father has given to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. So I go into the world proclaiming a gospel that is repent and believe. And here's the problem, and you'll catch it, I believe, here. We think that the proclamation of the gospel today goes like this. Hey, bro, Jesus loves you. Hey, bro, Jesus died for you. I challenge you on this. Find that in the New Testament. Find it. Read the book of Acts and see if the apostles go about preaching the gospel, going into cities, placating to fallen sinners, saying, hey, bro, God loves you. So Jeff Durbin's idea is go to Acts and look at how the apostles taught lost people. Lawson says to be reformed is to believe and subscribe to the five points of Calvinism. Jeff Durbin says go to Acts and see how they taught people. Do you ever find any teacher in the book of Acts, whether it's Peter, John, Philip, the evangelist in Acts 8, Acts chapter 21, or Paul from Acts 9, Acts 13 onward, do you ever find anybody in the book of Acts, he says, you know, going out and telling people Jesus loves them, do you ever find them doing this? Do you have any scriptures in the book of Acts where they sit down and give these people an itemized list of, look, to follow Jesus of Nazareth, you're going to have to subscribe to total depravity. You're going to have to subscribe to unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. No, never will you find that. But that's what they get in a room and they talk about, and that's what Jeff Durbin gets up in front of his people and just celebrates. And they're just constantly contradicting themselves. And you know what you would have? If you had in the book of Acts where Peter, John, Philip, Paul sat down and said to the people, you know, y'all are totally depraved. And they said, what does that mean? And they said back to him, that means that there's nothing that you could ever do to even start moving towards God. They would say, you know, you hate God. You're opposed to everything that's good. You're totally polluted. And then they show him unconditional election and there's nothing that you can do. It's random, totally random, unconditional. And if it just so happens that you're a part of the totally random selected crowd, there's nothing you can do to fight it. If you might want to resist it, you're just, boom, you're going to become a believer. And then nothing you could ever do will cause you to lose your salvation or fall from grace. And all the audience, if they ever heard that, they would say, then what are we doing here? I can't change. I, I'm, I'm evil and I can't help it. I can't change. I can never please God. The cross may not affect me, may not be for me. Irresistible, there's nothing I can do to avoid it if he selects me, and there's nothing I can do to lose it. So what are we doing here? Let's all just go home. We play absolutely no role. The teachers can't help the lost, and the lost can't become saved, and the saved can't become lost. You have zero participation in anything. So why would these guys do what they're doing? They're doing it to sell books. They're doing it to get up and to be the figure so they can partake of the collection plate, the tithing plate. You know, my dad debated Dan Parker, and he's a primitive Baptist, and he makes no bones about it. When he comes to your particular group, he's getting the tithe plate. That's what he's getting. He's going out with it. That's why these guys are doing it. But you look at this system and say, well, I can't do anything about it. They would say, yeah, that's right. That's the whole point. And then he says this, Reformed is a recovery and restoration after Roman papists corrupted the truth. Did you hear that? It's towards the end of the discussion. Um, false teachers and then the truth became deformed by 
um, false teachers where tradition and ecclesiastical hierarchy became the authority. That sounds exactly like the Southern Baptist Convention. The ecclesiastical and the uh, hierarchical structure. Y'all doing it with conventions all across the board, but notice what he said. You know, Roman papists corrupted the truth, therefore it had to be reformed. Who corrupted? Corrupted it? The Romanists. Who are you calling reformers? Romanists. Augustine and Martin Luther were Roman papists. And then you have two pedo-baptist Presbyterians, John Calvin and John Knox. See these people down here? Look, I'm telling you, my, my advice to you is to read your Bible for yourself. But also, I would encourage you to start looking at some histories. You get some of these religious history books and you start seeing how ridiculous today's sectarian scene is. That these people out here are actually following the same people that they're condemning. Who messed everything up? Oh, the, the Pope did. Who are we going to let fix the problem? Followers of the Pope. Makes no sense. Martin Luther just had a handful of problems with the Romanist sect. He wanted to stay a good Romanist. He's a Romanist. That's Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. And then John Calvin, John Knox, John Calvin, like we said, history says, burned Michael Servetus at the stake for disagreeing with his beliefs. You don't, you do not want to be around John Calvin. That makes no sense, does it? They are following the reformers. Everything about this man's existence has to do with what Romanists did centuries ago. My, my religious existence is not about kicking back against somebody. My religious existence is absolutely based on the New Testament text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 2. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm not avoiding certain things because other people do it. I will avoid things because the New Testament tells me to, like, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the men. Someone says, well, Caleb, you know, a lot of Pentecostals, they use women preachers now. I, I don't avoid using women preachers because someone said, you know, Pentecostals do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything the Pentecostals do. Well, the Pentecostals gather on Sunday. Am I going to stop gathering on the first day of the week just because Pentecostals do? No. My existence and my actions are not predicated on what you do. They're not predicated on what the Romanists did centuries ago. But that's exactly how a reformer thinks, and they call themselves Protestants. Everything about them is either birthed from the Pope or has to do with kicking against the Pope. And, you know, it's like... The Pope is Papa, and you hear people talk about women who have father issues, and men too, I guess, but it's like they simultaneously hate their dad, but they some reason want to please him. That's a Protestant with the Romanist sect. They're kicking against the Romanists, but at the same time, they're spoon-fed by Romanists. It makes no sense, and I'm saying if you started reading some histories, you would say this is ridiculous. Totally convoluted and complicated, traditional, and a lot of times not even... In not even encouraging that you are thinking individual. With creeds, it's not about thought. It's about lining up and keeping your mouth shut. Here's a note from this book that I use a lot. Grace Alone, Salvation as the Gift of God. This is a Calvinist textbook. And look at what they say. Grace in the early church. Yet, if we examine, they say, yet if we examine what we do have, we find the discussions of grace prior to Augustine did not elaborate much on the idea of grace as God's unmerited favor. Boy, I tell you, that Augustine, he really, uh, he really shed some light on what Paul was saying, didn't he? And they're going to say, no, that's not what we're saying. That's exactly what you're saying. You need a creed to shed light on what the Bible says. You need Augustine to shed light on what Paul was writing. And I say, no, you don't. God gave us a book that we could understand. All this arguing that they do over people that they can't change minds because they say you're totally depraved. We're coming to our last point. He said we recovered pure worship. Let's see where he said that. How sinful man can be right with holy God and as well as, as what we heard today earlier from Dr. Ferguson, um, a restoration of the purity of worship in spirit 
and in truth. You know, he says, to be reformed, uh, we reformed the spirit of worship, purity of worship and spirit and truth. Does he think that improper worship has any bearing on your salvation? Remember now, worship is not one of the five solas. Grace alone, faith alone, glory alone. There's no worship alone in there. But now he says, well, somehow we restored uh, the purity of worship. None of these reformers would worship with you guys. Martin Luther says, The organ in worship is the insignia of Baal. The Roman Catholics borrowed it from the Jews. So these folk, Baptists, are out here saying, look, you know, we use instrumental music, and we have somehow restored the purity of worship. If Martin Luther were alive today, he would say, no, you did not. And he's a reformer, and he's a papist, and you're a Baptist, but somehow you care what he says. He would tell you, no, the organ in worship is the insignia of Baal, and the Roman Catholics borrowed it from the Jews. Here's what John Calvin is going to say. Musical instruments and in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and the restoration of the other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this, as well as many other things from the Jews. What actually is uh, really something is, I would say that too. When you go over to Ephesians 5.19, this is what we have authority for. Let me say this too. I don't believe this point because John Calvin said it. This is in the Bible and this is what I see. What did God command? What did he ask for? Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And then you say, well, David used a harp. Look, where is David? The Old Testament text. David was a Hebrew, an Israelite. You are not. I'm not. I'm a New Testament Christian. John Calvin got it. Why don't you burn incense and offer some animal sacrifices while you're at it? So this business where a person who's a Calvinist in today's world gets up and says, we're reformers, and that means we reformed uh, the purity of worship. You ask them, does worship have anything to do with your salvation? And he's going to say, no. Then what are you so worried about it for? Is worship part of the five solas? No. Then where'd you get this idea of purity of worship? And all these people who spoon-fed you, the reformers, they don't even agree with you. Here's some quotes. However you want to say his name, Ulrich Zwingli, Zwingli. Look at what it says here, this quotation. Zwingli's stress on biblical precedent grew. He gradually introduced re reforms in the Zurich church. Taken together, the result results were striking. The ornate cathedral was stripped bare of its statues, relics, pictures, and altar equipment. The organs were destroyed. Priestly vestments abolished and the walls whitewashed. The Roman Catholic Mass, with its high mystery, was reduced to a simple memorial meal. Now, I'm not going to agree with everything that these individuals do in history, but I'm making the point of, y'all look at them and take them when you want them, and you leave them when you don't. Same thing with these Roman papists. Y'all are just making it up as you go along. But my point is, as you say that you have restored purity of worship, these folk wouldn't even have worshiped with you. The organs in the churches are not particularly old, not a particularly old institution, especially in these parts, since they do not agree with the apostolic teaching. The organs in the great, in the great minster were broken up in the 9th of December in this year, 1527. From this time, from neither singing nor organs in the church was wanted. And so that's the moment where I say, look, I'm not taking what these people do as my authority, because look at what they just said. From this time forth, neither singing nor organs. Well, wait a minute. You're going you're gonna to have singing, which is in Ephesians 5.19. You're going to have singing. Well, these people said neither singing nor organ. So, see, I'm not letting history dictate anything to me. I'm going to my New Testament text, and I'm reading from the actual Scripture. Here's some more thought process that they had about instrumental music in that time frame. See, I'm saying you go back to these reformers, and they just pick and choose what they want. It says here, the Swiss reformers, nothing should be done but that which you have the express warrant of God's word for. Well, what do you just get express warrant for out of Ephesians 5.19? Singing. But he does not command instrumental music. And then look at what they say after that. Excuse me. The very silence of Scripture was prohibitive. Echoing the principle, he concluded that the Scripture denies that which it noteth not. Now, their thought process was, you go what by the Bible says, 
and they're saying, if the New Testament didn't ask for it, we're not going to do it. You start talking to me, see where I said I'm not allowing these people in history to dictate what I think and follow it blindly? I'm just making the case that if they were here today, they would not be with these Reformed people. And I'm also making the case of just read your Bible for yourself and stop following people blindly. I, I don't really make too much on silence, and a lot of stuff that people call silence is not silence. When somebody goes to Ephesians 5.19 and says, well, the New Testament's silent on music. No, it's not. That's a direct statement, as he said a moment ago, an explicit statement, speaking, singing. It's not that it's silent on the instrument. We have an exact discussion point, an exact command of what he commanded. That's not silence. And you go back, Hebrews chapter 7, where it talks about the priesthood. That's not silence either. God specifically said when he asked for the priesthood, when he set up the priesthood, it's the sons of Aaron. It's the Levites. And someone says, well, he didn't go through and then say, no, he said, it's the sons of Aaron, the Levites. That's not silence. That's an explicit statement. This is an explicit statement. Now, you might be watching this tonight and say, you know, I have never seen these quotes and I don't know half these people. And I'm saying too, you don't have to know who these people are to be a Christian. You can obey the gospel. You can be in the body of Christ. You can study your New Testament and be a free individual. And at the end of this discussion tonight, this is exactly what I'm calling for. Look, the people that I'm showing, Stephen Lawson, Jeff Durbin, Charles Stanley, you're going to have to start picking up their tradition. And someone says, Caleb, people who start studying with you, you're going to have to pick up your tradition. I don't want to put my tradition on them. Actually, in fact, uh, before we got started tonight, I was talking with my producer about stuff I had seen on Facebook of congregations down in Africa. And my question is, why are we trying to get African congregations to look like American congregations. I'm talking about the buildings. Everything has to be set up the way we do our buildings in America. We got to give them these uncomfortable wooden pews. Why is it the idea that when we take the gospel to a country, we have to take our setup with it? I don't get that. No, I don't want to put tradition on you. I want you to see the value of being a Christian. Your sins are forgiven. God's grace is put onto your account. The blood is put onto your account. And you start trying to make disciples out of non-believers and you try to get the sectarians to repent. Look at Acts eleven twenty six. 26. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You ought to just call yourself a Christian. Encourage your family members to get off this stuff about it. And they say, well, Grandmama was a Baptist, yeah, and Grandmama was a drunk. So what difference does that make? I'm saying you don't just look at your family members and say we just pattern after them. Be a Christian, be a disciple of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13. Now this I say that every one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I of Cephas, and I am Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Honestly, it's just like Methodists. I don't understand why anybody would come out and say, I'm Reformed. I'm Reformed. And then the other person says, I'm Methodist. It's like an action. The particular method. I'm a Protestant. What does that mean? I'm against the Roman Papists. Where's Jesus in all this conversation? You like John Wesley's method. Reformed, Protestant, you're kicking against Roman Papists. My existence as a Christian has nothing to do with the Roman papacy. Did they make a mess? They have made a mess just as much as Southern Baptists have made a mess. Hierarchical structure, conventions and whatnot. First Corinthians 12, 25, these are in your Bible and they ought to be more important to you. There should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care one of another. Uh, you know, religious folk, you tell them I'm a Christian and they're just hoping you don't talk to them. Isn't that awful? They are in some particular sect, and they hear you say, I'm a Christian. They're saying, man, please don't try, start trying to talk to me about your stuff. Religious people don't like other religious people, and non-religious people don't like religious people, which ought to tell you we have a huge problem in America. And I'm saying that the problem is y'all's European tradition. 1689, Baptist, London Baptist Confession. Nobody wants that or needs that. You're trying to go out here and make Baptists. They're out here trying to make Pentecostals. And the New Testament is calling for us to be Christians only, unified in the body of Christ. You say, well, how am I going to be in the body of Christ? Acts 18.8, 18, 
Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. I have that next to 1 Corinthians 1 to show you it obviously means something. The Calvinists say you don't have to do anything. The Southern Baptists don't like water baptism. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Beside, besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with word, wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made an effect. You know, he says, I came to preach the gospel. But he says in Romans chapter 6 that we're crucified with Christ. These people, when they heard the gospel, they were baptized. It's how you obey the gospel. When you obey the gospel, you become a child of God, you become a Christian, you become a member of the body of Christ. And you say, well, that sounds pretty simple. It is simple. And it's exactly what the New Testament teaches, and that's what I'm inviting you to be a part of, is just simply be a Christian. Acts 2.47, be added to the body of Christ, the church of Christ. If you'd like to study further and you watch tonight, you say, Caleb, I saw a lot of my own tradition in there and I'd like to do something about it. Well, we would like to help you be freed up from tradition and just simply be a New Testament Christian. 276-806-3641, Caleb G. Robertson at gmail.com. Email me, get on the informer list, let your friends know about what does the Bible say on YouTube, and then join us again Sunday night at 9 p.m. for more What Does the Bible Say. Now, for our TV audience, we say we love you. God bless you. Keep asking what does the Bible say. For our YouTube audience, we say we have more to come, so stick around. Now, this is the more to come. You know, this is how we were here the other night. i got to get set up now. I do a whole broadcast to my, I got local friends, man. Local friends who are Calvinists, and I just went to town on Stephen Lawson. Five-point Calvinist. He's a Reformed Baptist. I go to town on that stuff, and there's a lot of my brethren. They say, yeah, Caleb, good job. You're, you're doing the Lord's work. And I say, thank you. I appreciate the encouragement. But when I start exposing sinful activity amongst my own brethren, that's when they start saying, well, you're going too far. And so last time, and I'm saying it again, I'm not going to be hypocritical like that. I'm not going to go out there and talk to my sectarian neighbors, tell them they're lost, and then see sinful activity inside the body of Christ and act like it doesn't exist. And another thing that my dad said last night, look, you know what we're doing. We're about to start talking about the sinful activity going on inside the body of Christ. And my dad made the point last night where I think he said, Joe brother said that to him, you shouldn't be airing out the church's dirty laundry. What y'all ought to stop doing is acting like the church doesn't have dirty laundry. Now, I'm making a call for consistency. Y'all are parading as if people are perfect. Well, you, if you see bad stuff, you can't talk about it. Why? You say, well, it's going to shed a bad light on the church. Y'all are making the church look awful. This, the calling it out is not the issue. It's the people who are involved in it. But this business where you say, well, you can't air out this stuff and you can't call attention to it, Y'all have this fake parade that we never do wrong, that we never make mistakes, and that we never have to be called to repentance. And a collection of teachers inside the brotherhood are always talking about always these principles. And like someone says, it's bad, but I'm saying if it's a facade, it's a facade. Humility, you got to be humble. Well, you know, that idea of humility and humble, everybody wants to be humble which means you have humility. Nobody wants to be humiliated, right? Look, if you're calling people to repentance, somebody is going to have to make some statement here that, yeah, we have been on the wrong course and we're going to have to do right. And I'm saying a person, humiliation that breeds humility, why not? Someone says you're out here to just humiliate people? I'm here to bring about repentance, I'm here to make a call for consistency, which means I have to then expose the inconsistency. Now, Dad showed you this last night. Give a listen to it. This is Kirk Brothers. Kirk Brothers is president of Heritage Christian University in Alabama. Listen to what he says. ...of other schools have to deal with. And on top of that, we are a donor-driven school. So the decision before I got here was made 
that we were going to not be driven by student tuition, but by donations. So 20% of our budget will come from students. 80% comes from donors. That is exactly the opposite of how other schools work. Generally speaking, 80% of the budget comes from tuition, et cetera. 20% comes from donors. So that means that we're constantly raising funds, constantly looking for money. You know, every year I'm re-raising two and a half million dollars. Constantly looking for money. You know, every year I'm re-raising two and a half million dollars. Funds, constantly looking for money. You know, every year I'm re-raising two and a half million dollars. Now, tonight's discussion is I'm saying it's bad for business. Now, some people are going to hear what Kirk Brothers said, and they're going to say, well, that's good, right? That it's not just purely driven by tuition, but rather it's driven by donations. And someone might hear that, and they would say, well, that's good because, you know, the other colleges that they take government money, and they are always having to bow to things like Title IX restrictions. And you say, well, Kirk Brothers isn't going to have to put up with all that. No, what Kirk Brothers is going to have to do is he's going to have to appease a ton of different donors, which carries its own problem. It's not just the schools who take government money. It's not just the t tuition driven. He is now, like you said, every year, two and a half million dollars. This is a business. So when I come in and I make, a, and my dad comes in and other concerned Christians come in and we start making a call for consistency, they're, they're looking at me and you and they're saying, this is not about consistency. This is about the dollar amount because the schools are salaries. And everybody has to, on staff, has to have that salary every year. So they're looking at bottom line more than they're looking at line upon line. You know what I'm saying? Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. They're looking at the bottom line for dollar amounts. And what I'm doing tonight is that's the proof it's a business, and I've got more to come. But I'm also going to show you out of Steve Higginbotham's book that he actually agrees with what I'm saying. B.J. Clark agrees with what I'm saying. Phil Sanders agrees with what I'm saying. And their own documents prove that they agree that if you see sinful activity and you don't correct it, you are then just as guilty as the person actually committing it. And Steve Higginbotham says the same thing. But I have to revisit something really quickly. This is really what started our conversation. And I have to have a moment with you. Someone says, you know, we just kind of dived into this tonight. Uh, everybody out here is quoting this and no one's practicing it. This is 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke. Exhort, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Very few people are actually practicing that. Y'all are going around and you're quoting Ephesians 5.11. Have no fellowship with the uh, unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Well, you're not being very clear on who I should not have fellowship with, and then also these speakers are not reproving anybody so that I could look at their example and say, oh, that's who they're saying we shouldn't have fellowship with. Because they're literally with everybody. Who is it that, because it's in the text, is it not? Have no fellowship. Who is it that you all, on the Freed Hardeman lectures, when you quote Ephesians 5.11, who is it that you're saying I should not have fellowship with? Because Phil Sanders, Edmond Congregation in Edmond, Oklahoma, they are, or Oklahoma City, they are bringing Pepperdine speaker Phil Brookman just in the same area of Oklahoma. He's at Memorial Road. And Phil Sanders is at Edmond. They're next door neighbors. They bring Phil Brookman, Pepperdine speaker, to come in and be on their year end area wide worship. And I had a number of people say to me, Caleb, that's not good enough because you don't know how Phil Sanders felt about it. You say, the Edmond congregation made that decision, but you don't know how Phil Sanders feels about it. You can look at ptpair.com and Phil Sanders has his own tab, he has no problem with it. Phil Sanders absolutely has a pattern of fellowshipping with Pepperdine speakers and he goes down to Sunset. He has no problem with this. But I hear you. You say that wasn't good enough. Okay. I want you to see the picture. That, that's really what I want is I want you to see where the current situation is. Phil Sanders, Edmund, Phil Brookman comes to Edmond. Edmond is the housing congregation for his ministry in search of the Lord's way. But you say that's not enough of a connection for fellowship. Okay. I want to show you the 2021 
Harding University annual Bible lectureship. And if you tell me that Phil Sanders and Phil Brookman is not enough to sound your alarm, then how do you feel about Harding University September 2021? This just happened. I'm replacing that line because no one is reproving and rebuking. We're going to have to have some action here, right? Who was there? You say it's not enough Phil Brookman coming to Edmond, where Phil Sanders is. Was this enough? Here's David Shannon, David Shannon, president of Freed Hardman. It says right there, David Shannon is the 16th president of Freed Hardman University. And you know what? I just now saw that. And during his tenure, enrollment and fundraising have set new records. Dollar amount. Right? Is that not what I just said? Enrollment and fundraising have set new records. Is he noted like first one? Is he a fantastic Bible teacher? Is he the model Christian? He is a dollar raiser. Enrollment and fundraising have set new records. And in the 2021 Harding Lectures, who else was there? This is fine. This is not bothering me. Don't let it bother you. Who else is there at the 2021 lectures? What I'm going to do is just take all these animations out and don't let it bother you. And I can smile through it. And you can too. You say, I, I'd smile, but I just feel so bad about it. I feel bad about it too. Who's there? David Shannon is there. Harding Lectureship. Phil Brookman is there. Jeff Jenkins is there. And Bruce McClarty is there. These three men, David Shannon, are all sharing the pulpit. They are all fellowshipping with Phil Brookman. Now, let me ask you this question. You all are at the Freed Hardman Lectureship right now. Are y'all having fellowship? Because everybody who's posting on Facebook about it, y'all just keep talking about what rich fellowship. So you're telling me that at lectureships, fellowship takes place. Are these men not in fellowship with Phil Brookman? And Phil Brookman is a Pepperdine speaker? And we've already had the discussions. You say, well, what's wrong with Pepperdine? Instrumental music, women preachers. They have no problem with those two elements out at Pepperdine. If you're having fellowship right now, at FHU, how is it not fellowship when they're all at Harding together? And I'm saying, y'all, this is a business and you're bankrolling it. You're the membership, your children. I'm saying they're not kids. I'm talking about your offspring. Your offspring who represents the freshman class, every year this has to be done to get in the eyes of the freshman class to get your tuition funds. All of this, and it's not just the tuition funds. All these events require enrollments and fees and housing and whatnot. And all the while, this is who you've got. And you know, at the Harding 2021 Harding Lectureship, Dale Maynard, that's the Pepperdine logo, one of them, P for Pepperdine. Dale Maynard, Pepperdine speaker. Noel Whitlock, Pepperdine speaker. Greg Tidwell was there. He's over Gospel Advocate. Jim McGuigan was at the 2021. He was a speaker 2021, and he is a known Pepperdine speaker. Sunset School of Preaching just gave him some type of honorary award this year. My question, y'all, who's reproving? Who's rebuking? Nobody. Why is it not happening? Are you having fellowship at the Freed Hardman Lectures? You, you tell me, no, we're not having fellowship at the Freed Hardman Lectures. That's the only way that you're going to get around this. If everybody at Freed Hardman right now is having their fellowship, then everybody on this screen is having their fellowship. Now, what was it? David Shannon, during his time as president at Freed Hardman, enrollment and fundraising have set new records. David Shannon, Phil Brookman, who's a Pepperdine speaker, Jeff Jenkins, who's a Freed Hardman speaker, shared the pulpit with Pepperdine, Bruce, McCart Bruce McLarty has now been brought to Freed Hardeman. He's the minister in residence. He is a Pepperdine speaker. He has no problem sharing the pulpit with fellow Pepperdine speakers. Down here, all Pepperdine speakers, except for Greg Tidwell, 
But my point is he has no problem. You are in a political system. This is not about the Bible. And can I make another point too? Let's go back to David Shannon. Freed Hardeman, like, I'm trying to sound, sound an alarm right now for all of you to see. It's all about money, malpractice, sinful activity, instrumental music, women preachers. Freed Hard, I recognize this as I have the conversation with you. Freed Hardeman is not a Bible college. There are people in there getting business degrees. They're doing whatever process that they're going to graduate there, and they're going to go on to a medical school. They're going to graduate there. They're going to go to law school. I recognize that. When I called Freed Hardeman and I asked, I said, if I was going to take a Bible course at Freed Hardeman, how many people would be in class with me? And they said, oh, well, all freshmen have to take a New Testament class. I said, no, if I'm there to get a Bible degree, how many people are going to be in class with me? And he said, uh, probably about five. The college is not for religion, right? So when I come in and I talk about fellowship and I talk about New Testament doctrine, the institution that is Freed Hardeman College could not care less about those things. You got math students. What's the Bible to a math student? You recognize this lectureship is going on and probably they just think students over there thinking, all these people and their parents have to come here every February. They're in there getting liberal art degrees. Just, they're going to get a job. But you acting like it's a religious institution is just ridiculous. The same thing for Pepperdine, the same thing for Harding. They are fooling you while taking your dollar. Now, you, that statement a moment ago where I said enough, you said, Caleb, Phil Sanders, Phil Brookman, you said that wasn't enough for you. Well, now I'm showing you direct connection of David Shannon to Phil Brookman, Jeff Jenkins to Phil Brookman. All these people get down to Harding and they have no problem. Do you know what used to constitute enough? In 1997, Ben Vick, I know Ben Vick. I have stayed in Ben Vick's home. Ben Vick was the camp director where I went to camp. Ben Vick, the congregation where Ben Vick is, they supported me while I went through preaching school. That's why I've said all this before. None of this is personal. All of this is based on principle. But Ben Vick, in 1997, he wrote up an event, Heartland, Heartland 1970. What is that? 97, thank you. Ben Vick, Jr. And he's talking about the same people I've been talking about. He's naming Don McLaughlin, just like I did. He's a Pepperdine speaker. Don McLaughlin, not Ben Vick. Don McLaughlin is a Pepperdine speaker, and Ben Vick was naming him in 97. He then named Prentice Matter, and then he got to this fellow here. And Ben Vick just said, you know, I don't know Harold Red, but any brother who runs with the false teachers is going to be marked with them. That used to be good enough. Look, if you're going to be with Don McLaughlin, no, I don't have to know who you are. If you're in fellowship with Don McLaughlin, that's it. Down there at the bottom, we've been saying it. Jeff Walling, Rubel Shelley, that's just y'all's go-to. And Ben Vick said, well, if you're, if you're messing around with Jeff Walling, I don't have to know who you are. I just know that that's it. That's it for me. Well, then that means that Ben Vick is done with David Skidmore because David Skidmore is going to be, has been, and will be at Jeff Walling's Winterfest. I don't hear anything out of Ben Vick. And the only thing I can think of is the fact that his sons went to Freed Hardeman. That's what everybody's doing right now. Everybody is unwilling to speak out against their alma mater. He's got another son, Donnie, who went to Memphis. Well, I went to Memphis. My dad went to Memphis. My brother went to Memphis. So what? He has, uh, Ben Vick had the quote in the past where he said, he wrote up Memphis School of Preaching, says, not one thin dime for the Memphis School of Preaching. This used to be enough that if I could find you not reproving, not rebuking false doctrine and error, if you're not going to do that, then that's enough. From 1997 to 2023, what changed, right? Because this has been everybody's principle. Phil Brookman, he's a Pepperdine speaker where they use instrumental music, where they allow women preachers. And he comes over to Edmond, which is the house for Phil Sanders' TV ministry in search of the Lord's way. And no one bats an eye. 
You say, that connection's not good enough. I show you direct connection between all these individuals, Phil Brookman, Pepperdine Speaker, Pepperdine Speaker, Pepperdine Speaker, Dale Maynard, Noel Whitlock, Jim McGuigan, Bruce McLarty. And somehow you say, Jeff Jenkins is so sound. David Shannon's so sound. Greg Tidwell so sound. Then why is nobody reproving and rebuking? Because it's a business. And if you're not involved in the business and you just don't want to talk about your alma mater, that's just as bad. Now, I said about Ben Vick, I know Ben. I know his family. And that's fine. Like they say, I'm not the closest friend. That's okay. Uh, I love them. And I don't have any bad feelings about them. And I'm about to get into this discussion with Steve Higginbotham that he really agrees with me. I don't have any bad feeling about Steve Higginbotham. And if he didn't get in the mail, he didn't get in the mail. But when he told everybody that he had cancer, I get my typewriter out. I, uh, I typed him a note on my typewriter that I was praying for him. And the way that I said it was, I could remember when my dad got, I'm 17 years old, my dad gets colon cancer. And I told Steve, I said, more than, I said, more than I'm praying for you, I'm praying for your son. I said, because I remember what that was like. And I don't know, like I think I heard later on that his cancer maybe wasn't like that extensive. Uh, and he made a joke, I think, where he said, people heard I had cancer and they just lost it. Well, if he's really healthy, hey, that's great. I'm happy for him and his family. It's, none of this is personal, right? I hope he's got good health, enjoys his family. Look, none of this is about that. But what I'm about to do, I'm about to take his book, and I think he put this out in 2020. 2020. And the book is called When the Prodigal is Your Prodigal. Glorifying God Through the Brokenness of Losing a Child to the World. It's a public book. No one can really be upset, I don't think, for me quoting his book and using it now. Obviously, he put all the information out there. And so, I'm going to read to you from several pages, starting at page number 62. And so, what it is, is, you know, and I'm saying for what he did. When I said the other week when I was on here, if I see something good, I give it a thumbs up. Steve Higginbotham has a son who's living in homosexuality, and he has withdrawn fellowship from his son. And he writes this book, and he's making a big point where he says family members who are Christians are not exempt from church discipline. And I say, hey, I agree with that. Thumbs up on that principle. Here it is, page number 62. God's teaching about withdrawing fellowship does not apply when the person being disciplined is your own family member. And he says, he's answering somebody. Quite frankly, I have wrestled with this point for more than 30 years. When I was preparing to become a preacher, and after I began up there at the top, I'll try to make it big for you. After I began working as a preacher, I never had an adequate answer to this question or assertion. When I taught on the matter of church discipline, I always feared that someone would ask the question, but what if the person being disciplined is your husband or wife, father or mother or son or daughter? When those questions were raised, I gave feeble answers that usually introduced a nebulous concept of what to do when faced with conflicting commands from God. But several years ago, I came to grips with why this question was so troublesome to me. It was not because the Bible is unclear, but it was because the answer I wanted to justify was unjustifiable. I wanted to be able to say, God would not expect you to discipline and withdraw from your own family. I wanted to be able to offer people an out to difficult situations in which they found themselves. Consequently, I struggled to find a way to harmonize what the Bible teaches with what so many practiced. Now, let me see. Go to the next page. Furthermore, this is page 64. Furthermore, who gets to decide what family relationships fall under the realm of discipline and what ones are excluded. For instance, someone might say, surely God would not expect you to withdraw from your spouse or children. Well, then what about your uncle, aunt, grandparents, grandchildren, cousins, second cousin, etc.? One would be hard-pressed to set forth biblical teaching that allows one to parse all these relationships. Any such parsing is arbitrary and has no biblical basis at all. If the purpose of discipline is to impose a penalty or punishment, 2 Corinthians 2, that persuades one to stop sinning, who better to withdraw fellowship from an unrepentant sinning brother than his own 
family. What significant impact would it have on an unrepentant sinning brother to learn that a fellow brother who sits on the far side of the church building and with whom he has never even had a conversation is going to withdraw fellowship? Now, you see what he's doing here. He's saying that the Bible teaches you have to withdraw if it's your family members and they need church discipline, you have to withdraw fellowship from them. He says this, For the practice of discipline to be impactful and provide a compelling reason for a brother steeped in sin to repent, it would require significant loss. That is precisely that what would occur if he lost fellowship not only with the church but also with the closest Christian friends and especially his own flesh and blood family. Such a loss would force him to weigh whether the high price of his sin is worth the cost. When people refuse to discipline their unfaithful Christian family members, they unwittingly are complicit with their family members' sinful way of life. That's guilt by association. Someone says to Steve down here, he says, Not too long ago I had a brother offer me a well-intentioned rebuke for disciplining my own son. He revealed to me that his Christian son was walking in a sinful lifestyle, but he said, We have not handled his situation as you have. We have not withdrawn fellowship from our son, but it is not like we are encouraging him in his sins. We know we do not approve of his lifestyle. We just think that if he is to ever repent, we must continue to fellowship. Steve says, it pains me. It pains me to hear such justification for disobedience to God's commands. And he says down here at the bottom, surely we know that partial obedience is just a euphemism for disobedience. This book is just like the 1992 Collierville Lectures, What a Fellowship. Steve Higginbotham is giving himself a self-rebuke, a self-condemnation. He is right now the picture of inconsistency. What this man said, whoever it is, the brother who uh, gave him that rebuke, what did he say? We haven't withdrawn from fellowship from our son, but it's not like we're encouraging him in his sins. Freed Hardeman isn't about to remove Pepperdine speakers, but everybody knows that they don't actually agree with what goes on at Pepperdine. He knows we don't approve of his lifestyle. Look, Pepperdine knows what Freed Hardeman thinks about Pepperdine. And right now, I'm telling you, at the end of the day, if Pepperdine is seeing this, they should be upset at the inconsistency of Freed Hardeman College. You guys talk trash out of one side of your mouth and then you're using these other guys. But we all know that you don't agree with it. What does he say here? For the practice of discipline to be impactful and provide a compelling reason for a brother steeped in sin to repent, it would require a significant loss. That is precisely what would occur if he lost fellowship, not only with the church, but also his closest Christian friends. And everybody goes to these lectureships and they see their friends who they haven't seen in a long time. And you know, when I weigh Steve Higginbotham's quotes here against a picture like this, what I can tell is that none of y'all like each other. According to Steve's writing, Steve Higginbotham says, it would be a huge blow for a Christian to lose the fellowship of his very close friends. You all obviously don't think anybody here is friends. You would say, well, what, do, what good would it do if we withdrew from them? I guess y'all aren't friends because that's the card that y'all pull when I start saying this. You say, well, the lectureship isn't fellowship. Well, it is when it's your friends are there. But and what are we saying here? My friends are at the lectureship. I thought we were supposed to be God's children the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. But no, someone says, no, these are my friends and I have fellowship with them. These are Christians that I, they're not my friends and I don't have fellowship with them. And you say, that is bad. And I'm saying, yeah, that's what the business created. This is, and someone then says, Caleb, the schools aren't the church. These are all Christian people. And you're all coming together for a Bible lectureship. And you're bringing in people who are known false teachers elsewhere. But you don't do anything about it because everybody is scratching each other's back. David Shannon goes to Harding, and what do they do? They praise him for his money work at Freed Hardeman. During his tenure, enrollment and fundraising have set new records. All of this is about money changing hands. Everybody getting a piece of the pie that is the incoming freshman class. How do you feel about this? Steve Higginbotham, he agrees with what I'm teaching. His own book teaches guilt by association. He says, if you don't do something about it, you are complicit in their activity. They unwittingly, right here, they are unwittingly 
complicit with their family member's sinful way of life. So how are you not unwittingly complicit with the false teachers from Pepperdine who are coming to Reed Hardeman? Surely, he says, we know partial obedience is just a euphemism for disobedience. Look, the only connection I have with Steve Higginbotham, <laughs> brother in Christ, that's my connection to him. I didn't take classes from him because I didn't go to East Tennessee. I've had contact with him on Facebook. That's about it. But I'm saying all of you right now who are students at East Tennessee, your teacher is Overfried Hardeman contradicting his own book. He puts a book out, 2020, 2023, he's totally contradicting his book. He's complicit in their activity. And someone sees this and you read the book and you, you're watching this particular broadcast and you say, man, Steve, you would withdraw from your own son, but you will not reprove and rebuke over at Freed Hardeman? I would hate for his son to see this. You guys withdrew from me and you're over there with Pepperdine speakers? That's why I say it's the picture of inconsistency. Steve Higginbotham working with the Carnes Congregation, the East Tennessee School of Preaching. Fellowship, to keep fellowship with your homosexual son while being in the conservative circle is bad for business. He would probably be fired. Number two, distancing from Pepperdine speakers while at Freed Hardeman, making the fuss, rocking the boat, stirring the pot, in his mind, would be bad for business. Why? Because East Tennessee, Will Heinstein, the director of East Tennessee wants to stay in close to Freed Hardeman, which is why students have to go there. Memphis School of Preaching, students have to go to the Freed Hardeman lectures. Why? Because they all want to be able to transfer their credits to what we all, for some reason, consider to be a conservative school. You are not a conservative school while you are bringing in Pepperdine speakers. You see how this works? Keeping fellowship with your homosexual son is bad for business. Distancing from Pepperdine speakers while at the Freed Hardeman lectures is bad for business. Steve Higginbotham is a businessman. Now, this is where someone's going to say, Caleb, you went too far by bringing up his son. No, it's a public book. I mean, he put the information out there for everybody. And I, hey, I applaud for writing the truth on withdrawing from family members. More people need to hear that. But when you do it with your homosexual son and then turn around and fellowship all these Pepperdine personalities, Pepperdine speakers, it's totally inconsistent. It, there's really nothing more to say. Everybody knows exactly what they need to do. Because we quote it. I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We're waiting on people to start speaking out. We're waiting on men to start saying, look, if y'all are going to be bringing Pepperdine speakers in, I'm going to start saying something. So if that means you're going to uninvite me, I guess you're uninviting me, and I'm going to tell people why you uninvited me. Why would we not say it? And here's my question, y'all. If you're bringing Pepperdine over, why can't everybody just freely go over to Pepperdine? And they would start having a cow, which I'm saying last night my dad played the clip where... Earl Edwards said, well, if you've been on Pepperdine once, I'm questioning you. <laughs> no, you're not. David Skidmore is with Winterfest, Jeff Walling at Winterfest, Dale Maynard, Noel Whitlock, Bruce McClarty, all Pepperdine speakers. You're not saying anything. Now, I say businessman. See if Higginbotham over at Freed Hardeman is sitting in the chief seat while his book absolutely contradicts his actions. My son, Matthew, took this picture of me during the Freed Hardeman University Open Forum Question and Answers. Man, you're on the panel for the Open Forum. You see it? No? There? Where? How do you spell fellowship? Big F, little F. Alan Hires versus Rubel Shelley. In 1984, do you know, 1984, do you know that Alan Hires gave Rubel Shelley 10 minutes to talk from the floor? Rubel Shelley talked for 10 minutes from the floor. Alan Hires answered back. People started coming to the mic so they could give Rubel Shelley a piece of their mind. Steve Higginbotham is sitting on the panel, and what are they doing? The Pepperdine speakers are going to go 
absolutely free. Unreproved, unrebuked, everybody in the audience is going to have no clue. And I say, y'all, this is brotherhood bishops and cardinals who have the power to blackball you. See, my dad and I, <laughs> we don't do the meeting campaign and we don't do lectureship campaigns. So what are they going to take from me? What they will do, what they could do, is they could basically start finding out people who do support me, and they can get on the phone and say, look, uh, and that's what they'll do. You're supporting Caleb Robertson. If you're supporting Caleb Robertson, we're going to have trouble. Well, okay, why don't you do that with Pepperdine? You're gonna, if you do it with me, do it with Pepperdine. And that's the thing. My dad talked last night, and he showed where a member of the church referred to us, his own brethren, as a cult. Man. What, what do you say about Pepperdine coming to Fried Hardeman Lectures? You have the chance to do it. You have the platform. That's Dr. Donnie DeBoard. Doctor. Yeah, I'm saying I'm getting, I'm, I mock. That I have to pretend like the people with these degrees and the chairs on the elevated platform mean anything when there's no reproving, no rebuking. And it's just getting worse and worse. And you know, it is getting worse and worse. And that's what I said to my dad when we started doing this when February came around. When my dad showed me Phil Brookman and Phil Sanders, I said, man, how is it just seeming like it's getting worse? And then we found 2021 Harding, and it's like, it is getting worse. And then we start finding that all these Pepperdine speakers are coming to Freed Harding and say, it's getting worse. And Steve Higginbotham writes a book about fellowship and then does what at the Freed Hardeman lectures? He's a businessman. David Shannon is a businessman. What I said earlier about, you know, their friends and fellowship, I said this a moment ago, and I want to take some time to do it again. Like I said, I mean that when I say it. I would hope that Steve Higginbotham's other son who's been disfellowshipped, I, I would hope that he doesn't see this because it is horrendous, the inconsistency. But for everybody that's involved in it, it's like, I get it. You know, why don't we all just come out and say it? Because I get it. All of this is business. It's just business. It's advertising. Memphis School of Preaching. Come see us at the FHU Lectureship where you can also see Pepperdine speakers. Alan Hires, Big F, Little F. Y'all are practicing Big F, Little F. Come see us, Memphis School of Preaching at FHU. Florida School of Preaching, that's Brian Kenyon, at the 87th Annual FHU Lectureship. Come see our booth in the display area. Come see us after you see Pepperdine speakers. <laughs> Sunset. Sunset International Bible Institute at Freed Hardeman, who regularly, I'm saying Sunset, will regularly and freely use Pepperdine speakers. Drew Kaiser, author. Riddle Creek Publishing is at FHU Lectures. So some people are going to watch this and they're going to say, Caleb, if I don't go to these events, then people are not going to see my ministry. Quote, ministry. You know what would be good for your ministry? If it was actually worth something, it would do its own job and self-propel and word of mouth would actually take place. And it would not be this idea of always having to go out and sell something. Look, I recommend books, and it's not like someone says, well, you don't read our books. Hello? I read your books. Sometimes I'm reading books that aren't worth anything. That's why I say word of mouth. It's not this idea you say, if I, if I don't go there, people are never going to find out. If I don't go to PTP and sell myself, people will never find out. And if I don't go to all the other, if I don't go to Lads to Leaders and set up a booth, no one's going to find out. Magnolia Messenger, we are at the FHU Bible Lectureship. All this is a business for everybody else's business. The schools need business, and then everybody brings their own individual ministry and parades it and promotes and commercializes it. And I'm saying that righteousness and doctrine have fallen by the wayside to y'all's business. Here's a quotation. 1978, Restoration Review, Leroy Garrett went to the Abilene Lectures and look what he said about it. The lectureship is a phenomenon, attracting upwards of 10,000 from year to year depending on the weather, which more often than not is bad. Many, if not most, attend not so much for the lectures, but to see and be seen, to visit 
and to find out what's going on. A large tent is erected, which is half as long as a city block that houses displays, both commercial and promotional. Since 1978, that's what it's been about. The colleges need the freshman class, and the individual ministries need the colleges so they can set up booths and parade their wares. Y'all, if we don't come to this moment and say that if this is not filthy lucre, what is? Because y'all are just eviscerating in your four walls. You are eviscerating the man-made sects for using a piano. You talk trash about the 1906 Christian church. Those people don't believe in the authority of the Bible. They use a piano. You're inviting Pepperdine. They use instrumental music. You look at all the Pentecostal folk. You look at your Methodist neighbors. And some of y'all got Presbyterian family members. And you say, well, they won't let us talk Bible. They don't know any Bible to talk about anyway. For using women preachers. Pepperdine uses women preachers. And Pepperdine speakers have come to Freed Hardeman. And y'all aren't doing anything. And when I say something, Todd Clippard, these different individuals, and I'm saying <laughs> that them Robertsons, that cult over there in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the one in fellowship with Pepperdine, though, right? I'm the one who's calling out for consistency, and I'm actually the one who, in the room, is reading the books to even say that, to know what Big F, Little F Fellowship is, and to say that Fried Hardeman is doing it. Here's the other one. Ira Rice, let me talk to you about mine and your relationship. How are we doing? <laughs> this ain't no joke. Can I come to Freed Hardeman next year and get a booth? Can I put up a What Does the Bible Say booth in Freed Hardeman in 2024? You say, Caleb, you are out of your mind. I don't use a piano on Sunday. I don't advocate women preachers. So what would you possibly bar me from the grounds for? When Leroy Garrett went to Abilene, he said, it's just politics to see and be seen, to visit and to find out what's going on, commercial and promotional. Here's Ira Rice, 1970 at Abilene. He says, there is, same school, there as Leroy Garrett, there is much more at Abilene that needs, to, needs the careful attention of the brotherhood, and Lord willing, I plan to help give it the attention through this newsletter. As soon as I have that much space to spare at all one time, the latest offense of a large and growing number of offenses is that whereas Gary Freeman and R.B. Sweet Company, practically any and all false teachers' writings among, among us are displayed and sold freely at the Abilene Students' Exchange, Acts on the Root, all three volumes have been banned. So what did Leroy say? It's just a bunch of politics, see and be seen, you know, show your wares. But Ira says, well, I can't show my wares. They banned all my books. In 1955, Freed Hardeman arrested Leroy Garrett. What's going to happen if I try to get a booth at the 2024 Freed Hardeman Lectures? Can I come? A lectureship isn't fellowship. You don't have to tell anybody you're in fellowship with me, but can I come set up a booth and try to get money like everybody else is? This is exactly where we have arrived. That I have to ask that question. Can I even come down there without actually thinking I might get the police called on me? Do I get to set up a booth like everybody else does? Pepperdine is in the room, but Caleb Robertson cannot be. Now, as I close, we are really concerned, and we talk about this behind the scenes. And my dad said this earlier as he basically was walking out of the door. He said, I just, because I started teaching the prophets on Wednesday morning on our school schedule, I talked a lot about Jonah the other day, and my dad was walking out the door. He said, he said I really hope that these people don't think, these brethren don't think that we feel about them the way Jonah felt about people. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish. I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, great of kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. That's not me. Okay. Y'all may not know me personally. We may have never met. I am not hoping anything bad on you. Like I said, 
I've stayed in Ben Vic's home. I know his kids briefly. I don't want bad things for them. I want folk to start speaking out. B.J. Clark, I pray for his wife's health, pray for his son's health, all these different people who are involved. I'm not hating on you like Jonah hated on Assyrians. I just want there to be repentance. Repentance. And I can say this too, if repentance takes place, we get to move forward. Uh, sometimes, you know, I do look at quite a bit of stuff. I've always had a hard time putting my finger on the whole Dave Miller scene years ago. But one man told my dad, these people were really giving him down the road for his association with Dave Miller. And, you know, whatever he said, he repented of it. But no one let him get past it. And, and he told my dad, he said, Johnny, I could write a letter of repentance and sign it in my blood. And sign it in my blood, and those people would not let me live it down. That's not me either. I'm not trying to, like, eternally mark anybody. But if there's things that need to be corrected, they need to be corrected, and we ought to do it now. Can I say this as my final point? I'm not doing you like Jonah. I love you. I'm not going to be upset if corrections start taking place. I'm going to say, hey, this is fantastic. I'd probably promote, if there's real repentance and correction, I'll start promoting it for you. But don't give me the stuff about, well, Caleb, you don't like any of these people and it just comes across as ugly. These guys know I like them, and it's not personal. I know Cody McCoy personally. I have met Aaron Gallagher on a number of occasions. I don't know him as well as I do know Cody. I like Aaron. I like Cody. This is not a who likes who. This is my friends versus your friends. None of that. I like these guys. They are my brothers in Christ, and I count them as special friends. And I like Don Blackwell, too, not to leave him out, but I've never met him. What are you guys saying here? What are you doing? I know Cody McCoy. He goes through school. He's now the director of operations at House to House, Heart to Heart. What are you doing about Pepperdine coming to Freed Hardeman and then David Shannon coming over to polishing the pulpit? What are y'all doing about the fact that Steve Higginbotham is the preacher at Carnes? He's like the face. He is more the face of East Tennessee than Will Heinstein, let me tell you. Steve Higginbotham is the face of East Tennessee. What's he doing about Pepperdine speakers being at Freed Hardeman and then he's going to get to come right over to polishing the pulpit? B.J. Clark is the director of Memphis School of Preaching, and he's over at Freed Hardman right now having fellowship with Pepperdine speakers, and he's going to come right down, I believe in August, to PTP. I say it, I'm saying it now, I don't, I don't just love you guys, I like you guys. There are guys across the board I'm praying for. I don't know everybody, so I don't know, if I don't know you, I can't pray for you. But I'm praying for these people, you know. I like his kids, and I think his kids like me. None of this is personal. I'm saying something needs to be corrected, and y'all obviously have the platform to do it. Do we have the conviction enough to do it? I love y'all, and I like y'all, and I can, I can do all the, you know, having a good time with everybody. Billy Bland told us as he walked out of the classroom one day, he said, Brethren, I love y'all, but I wouldn't want to go camping with you. And we all laughed. Hey, I'd probably like to go camping with a number of y'all. Nobody ever said that you're bad people. And that was another discussion. David Shannon, no one said David Shannon was bad. He may hate all this just as much as anybody else, and his conscience may be eating at him, and he just says, well, what am I going to do? Not go out and fundraise? What am I going to do? Let the school fall, fall apart? And that's why I say, well, if he started letting his convictions guide him, they'd fire him before they let the school fall apart. That's what everybody's really thinking about. Salaries going away, funding being pulled, being blackballed. Well, you know, I thought we were out here and we all had a mind of at some point we might suffer for the cause of Christ. I love you. Before we got started tonight, I, I prayed before the program. I'm gonna, it's probably, he'll probably be in bed, but I pick up my baby and I would pray with him that the church is doing better by the time he grows up. Can you help me? Can you help me and my baby and just shoot for consistency for when he's grown? You can talk to me. I won't bite your head off. 276-806-3641, Caleb G. Robertson at gmail.com. I love you. God loves you. We're just trying to be consistent. We're trying to follow the word. Keep asking what does the Bible say. Have a good night. God bless you.